The guy says, sure, and knock yourself out. So sure enough, he goes back there and there's another soiled piece of scripture in there and he pulls it. He collected most of the book of Romans and other uh, New Testament. We found out later that there was a commandant at the prison there that was using the Bible that he got from a missionary as toilet paper. Here we are in chapter eight, a continuation of what happens in chapter seven, another vision that comes. Chapter eight, verse one, it says, this is what the Lord showed me. This is Amos talking. This is what the Lord showed me. Behold, <clears throat> a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what do you see? And I said to him, a basket of summer fruit. Right away, we see a couple of things here. Number one, not something that's really in, in the passage, but something I kind of recognize this week in my own heart is that I read this whole chapter the first time and I was like, what? And then you read it again and you're like, I, I, don't, I don't know. Like, you know, we read it three or four times. And then about the fifth time you read it and you're like, okay, I see that. I like that. There's, you see a, thing, a couple things you, you like right after five. Then after 10 times reading it, then as a whole, the whole chapter, I can say, this is what God's trying to say as a whole. I love it. And then about the 12th or maybe the 15th time reading through it, then you're like, all right, I'm reading verse one and I'm excited because I know what's coming next. And I read verse five and I'm excited. And I read verse, and even though the title of the message today, by the way, is a dark judgment, it's not something we're excited about the redemption that's coming because I know what God's doing here. So I would implore you as people of God, I know a lot of times that we, we listen to our Bible on, uh, in the car on the way, right? And we hear it from other people, but the word of God is so precious <clears throat> that the first time sometimes we read a hard passage like this, we're like, I don't, I don't get it. And it would be easy to move on to chapter nine and say, I didn't understand that, move on to the next one. But stay with me here and read this and then read it again and then read it again. So by the 10th time you read it, you say, Lord, I see what you're saying. And by the time the 15th chapter or 15th time you read the chapter, you say, wow, I'm excited because I know what's coming. That's how I hope we read the Bible here. So after we're finished today, don't go home and read Amos chapter nine. Go home and continue to read chapter eight. Say, Lord, we just learned about this. We just saw it. Let me read it again. This is how we ought to approach the word of God, not just three chapters a day and move on. I think I understand it, but read it and meditate again and again until your heart sings for joy. That's what I found this week is that there's beauty in this, even though there's destruction in this chapter. So here we are just in the first verses. Here's, I see this basket of summer fruit. Some descriptions would just say um, ripe fruit or overripe fruit, right? We're about to see that it's, he's talking about the ripeness of destruction that is coming. So he says, Amos, what do you see? So we see God talking to Amos. He actually does two things here. It seems like one, but there's two. First, he shows him the vision. And then secondly, he talks to him and says, Amos, tell me what you see. In Hebrews chapter one, uh, it says that in the, in our, with our ancestors in long time ago, that God th spoke through prophets in diverse in many ways, in mysterious ways. But in the last days today, he speaks through his son. So today we don't hear from prophets. We read his word. We hear from the son. Even when we hear the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit teaches what and who Jesus is. So we hear through his son everything that we hear today. And yet back then it was through the prophet. So today we don't hear from the prophet that we see a vision and we don't hear God say, what do you see? But God does get our attention, right? Sometimes God will show us something. And oftentimes it's in his word. And oftentimes it's with your mom or with your dad or with your, with your kids. Or sometimes it's with your coworker or with someone in your family or, or someone of accountability in the church. They show you something, right? This is from God to show you. But sometimes it's not enough. And you get this budge, and, and he says, Amos, what do you see? He doesn't just show him. He says, hey, tell me what you see here. So a lot of times, I think when we see something that God has to share with us here, he shows it to us, and we kind of ignore it, and we go on, and we say, I got it, I move on. And then he nudges us, and he says, Christian, what do you see? So I, I encourage you as, as you read your scripture and you hear things that people are sharing with you about your life and the way that you ought to be and the way that you ought to live. Sometimes God shows us something and we ignore it. And then he gives us a little nudge and says, what do you see, Christian? Show me, look at what I'm trying to show you that you might change, that you might be spared, that you might live because there's something dark coming here. And they ignored first the vision and then Amos is nudging. What do you see? Tell me what you see. People will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. 
So here's the worst part of what's going to happen. It's not just that your land will rise up and shake and fall in and you're going to have this earthquake. It's not that people are going to mourn and they're going to be hurt, but rather here's what's going to happen. I'm going to send a famine and it's not going to be just food famine or water famine, but it's going to be a famine for people that will not hear the words of the Lord anymore. So see the importance that God puts on like your spiritual health. At first, we think it's like a food famine, and we're like, okay, well, we've endured that before, or water, okay, well, we've endured that before, but a spiritual famine where those who will not even hear the word of God anymore, okay? So three ultra-important things that we see in this passage right here, in this first one. Number one, listen to how the famine comes. God says, I will send a famine through the land. It's not that they've ignored God so much that they're just kind of deaf to it, that there's going to be people there and people are going to be, I I just don't want to hear it. But rather, even if they wanted to hear it, we see in the next verse, it says they will run, they will stagger from sea to sea, from north to east. They're going to look for the words of God and they're not going to find it. It's not just that they're ignoring it and that it's not there, it's there for them if they want it. But God says, I'm going to remove the blessing of your word, of my words from your people. This is an act of judgment against Israel. Can you think, can you imagine once they're removed how precious the words of God would seem? God takes them and he says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mess up your land, all your crops and all your schedules and all that kind of stuff. You think that you've got under control that you might live and prosper. I'm gonna wreck it all. And it's going to be like mourning throughout your land. It's going to feel like you've lost your only son. That's what it's going to feel like. But it's going to be worse because this famine is going to come. And it's going to be a famine of hearers of the word of God. No one's going to want to hear it, even if someone was preaching it. And if you wanted to go seek it out, you would go from sea to sea, from north to east, anywhere you want to go. And you will not find anyone to be able to preach it. Not just because they don't want to hear it, but because God has removed the blessing of hearing the word of God. Isn't that fascinating? Oh, we don't want that here, do we? I don't know where we are in this process. I'm not going to pretend to tell you that this is some American prophecy or this is some New Hope prophecy or anything like that. I won't tell you that. But I will say this. I want New Hope and I want us and I want me and I want my family. I want my children to be people that hold the word of God so precious that there's nothing that they would do, nothing they wouldn't do to seek it out or to hear it or to have it be a part of their lives and, a, and, and that they're meditated on their heart and on their soul. Now listen to this. I was gonna say all three of them. I, I only said two of them. We'll come back to the other one. There's a story of a man. <laughs> His name is he's, he's a Vietnam man. No, he's from Vietnam. His name is Haim Pham. H-E-I-N-P-H-A-M, Haim Pham. Now he was a Vietnamese guy. Uh, even before the Vietnam War started, he knew English well. And so when the soldiers came in, he actually was given a Bible in English and was given a Bible and read this thing. And so he's seeking out the word of God. He reads this and he doesn't understand it. So he goes and he finds a missionary and he says, tell me what this means. And he professes faith in Jesus Christ because of this Bible that he receives. So he's in Vietnam now during the war and just as a civilian, he was not a, not as a warrior, not a soldier or anything like that. But the Americans would come and, and he would translate for them and he would help. And, and the, the missionaries would come and he would help translate for them, translate words, but also translate their messages and things. And he was a very strong Christian man that helped both the Americans uh, in the war, but more importantly, the missionaries there. And there was never in battle, never did anything like that. But communists took over Vietnam. Now they're gone. Missionaries are nowhere to be found. He's there. And now they're saying, Hein, listen, because of your association with who he was, we've got to throw you in jail. So they threw him in jail for months at a time. Then they would release him. They would find another charge. They would throw him in jail. Then they would release him. Several times this man goes in jail. There's one time he was in jail and the sole purpose, they said, we've got to get that Western idea of thinking out of your brain. We've got to get... English out of your brain. We've got to get this Bible that you proclaim means so much to you. We've got to get it out of your head. We've got to get it out of your brain. So he's in jail just being indoctrinated. Said they wouldn't let him read English. They wouldn't let him speak English. They would give him other literature to share that, that, uh, that he would learn at their feet, right? And he said, day by day, I would wake up in the morning. I'd say, Lord, keep me strong. Help me to know you and to trust you and to love you even in this. And after months and months and months of this, no relenting, 
finally, he says he goes to bed one day, he's angry at God. And he says, I'm, I'm done with this. God, in the mor- this is going to be the last time I pray to you tonight. In the morning, I'm going to wake up I'm intentionally. I'm not going to pray to you. I'm not going to ask anything. I'm not going to pretend that I think you exist anymore. I'm just going to go on in my life, and I'm going to accept that this is it. God, I'm done with this. So he wakes up in the morning, and he does not pray for the first time since he became a believer. I do not pray to my Lord, he says. And he gets up, and one of the a prison guards says, hey, dude, you're on, uh, you got a duty today, and you're on toilet duty today. He's like, fine. He doesn't care, right? He's, he's lost all his hope. He goes in there, and he's cleaning the toilets and cleaning up and going around, and he looks in one of the waste baskets, and he sees English. It's the first time in months, maybe years, that he's seen English. So he looks around, he takes it out, he wipes it off, puts it in his pocket, doesn't look at it, he's excited. Why, I haven't read English in so long. And he goes about his day, and he finishes cleaning it, and he goes about everything, he goes back into bed at, late at night, and now everybody's sleeping, he looks around, and he pulls it out of the pocket, and he opens it up. Do you know what it says? Romans chapter eight. And we know that all things God works for the good of those who love him, who has been called according to his purpose. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave up, uh, gave up, gave him up all things, um, how also, how will he also along with him graciously give us all things? So here he is in a Vietnam prison reading Romans chapter eight, maybe the most encouraging verse that you could read in that situation. So he wakes up in the morning and says, Lord, I'm so sorry that I, that I doubted you. I'm so sorry for this. Just forgive me for this. As soon as he gets up early in the morning, he says, hey, do you mind if I clean the toilets again today? And the guy says, sure, and knock yourself out. So sure enough, he goes back there, and there's another soiled piece of scripture in there, and he pulls it. He collected most of the book of Romans and other uh, New Testament. We found out later that there was a commandant at the prison there that was using the Bible that he got from a missionary as toilet paper. And here he is in prison reading the word of God. Can you imagine how precious that was to him at that moment? I pray, my friends, that this is precious to us all the time. We had a missionary in Kids Don't Come several years ago, and he actually came up here, and uh, it, it lives in a country that, that Christianity is outlawed, and the Bible is not to be seen, is not to be read, is not to be owned. And he goes into Kids Zone, and kids ask him questions. What kind of animals are in your you know, country? Like all this stuff, right? They, they don't know. They just want to, they want to get to know him. So he's answering these questions, and then when he's done, I say, uh, uh, do, you, do you have anything else you want to share? He grabs the mic from me in two hands, puts it right up. He says, he says listen, my, my friends, my children here, he says, know and love the word of God. You don't know when it will be taken from you. Meditate on it. Memorize it. Read it. Read it again. Read it 15 times every chapter until you know, until your heart sings for joy with what it says, Right? He had been to a place where he recognized how precious the word of God was because it was taken from him. Just like this Vietnam, Vietnamese guy that had it taken from him and he read it, a soiled piece of the Bible in a, in a waste bag. He opens it up and it was so precious to him, right? That's how we want it to be. We don't want that judgment against us. We don't want to be people that God shows us something like this vision and says, hey, New Hope, what do you see? He says, if you don't, uh, if you don't uh, do this, if you don't fix this, if you don't... Uh, Seek justice within your ranks and help out the needy and help out the poor. If you don't do these things, whatever the charge may be against us as a people or against you individually, there's going to be a judgment. And one of those judgments could be that he would take away the ability to hear the word of God. That's terrifying, isn't it? 